Thank you so much for doing this. This is, you know, I cannot tell you, but I think you know how beloved you are. Do you know how beloved you are? Um, you yeah. know, right? Yes. And and this is this is a wondrous thing to uh, to live to tell the tale, to live to know this, and to to have uh, people that just worship and adore you and. Um, and you come from such lineage, you know. I I, I feel like you're like the the royal rock family of 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 America, um, and and I want to know about that. I want to know so many things, Steve. Um, first of all, you wrote a song called "The COVID." Tell us about your COVID song. <laughs> what what prompted you to write it? Sure. Uh, um, a friend of a friend at the time had um, uh, was a writer, David Camp. Yes. The writer, David Camp. Uh, he's kind of he's based in New York and he had written a song, uh, a lyric to a song called The COVID Kid. And I think it was inspired by there was something on the news about these kids on spring break that were even though while we were all kind of freaking out about COVID, they were mixing it up with each other and still they weren't going to let Kobe get in the way of their spring break and they were bringing it home with them uh something to do with that it was in Florida somewhere or something he had gotten wind of some story anyway he wrote a lyric and uh, we had never worked together before and he was wondering if I would write a song to his lyric and uh, I had never done that before I've tried many times and failed I've never been able to write to an existing lyric. And of course, uh, um, mine and everyone else's, you know, one of our favorite songwriters ever is is the team of uh, Bernie and Elton, Elton John and Bertie Toppin. And uh, um, I was always, always jealous of the fact that Elton got to start off with these amazing lyrics, these amazing poems. He didn't write a note of music until... Is was, that so? Uh, absolutely. Every single song they wrote was uh, wow. Bernie would write these poems and... Elton would put them in front of him. And, uh, you know, they're both geniuses and Elton would move things around as he saw fit and uh, uh, would be inspired to write these amazing songs that all, always had incredible lyrics. And um, so I was kind of jealous of that. And every time I had tried to do that in the past, it always just was, yeah, but it's not matching my, my rhythm scheme of my melody. And it was always felt like putting a, a square peg in a round hole or something like that. But I thought, okay, I'll try again. I'll try with this guy. I'd never, never done it before. I was dreading hitting a brick wall again, but um, I found this headspace where I kind of loosened up. And instead of trying to shoehorn the lyrics into my melody's rhythm that I would come up with, I kind of wanted went to serve the lyric more and just found a way to come up with a melody that sang really good, sang the lyric really good. And um, I got into the space and I was able to do it for the first time. So I was really excited about that. And so Steve, COVID has been such a huge part. I was telling you before we went live that it's the COVID crazies that sort of are the audience of this show because we were together every day when this whole thing started. What were you in the middle of when, when COVID struck? Um, nothing. It was kind of perfect oh. because I had just, I had kind of stopped touring, right? I stopped touring in um, October of 2019. And I'd stopped. Well, just touring. before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had decided I needed some time off. Uh, my dad was getting up there and feeling a little ill. And I just wanted to be home, wanted to be with my family, wanted to be in my studio. I was starting to forget my key commands to stuff after being away so much. And I, I just wanted to be home. I wanted to take at least a year off. And it wound up being I had to take a good three years off. And, uh, um, you know, it gave me a good excuse to do what it is I do anyway, which is kind of hole up in my studio and uh, uh, don't go out a whole lot. And order food in I all of a sudden had a legitimate excuse you know and were you productive very of course you were doing what I in the same way that I am today and I was before that just in my studio every day do, do you have a daily discipline 
Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it a discipline. That's the thing with having a home studio is I love, uh, for instance, this morning it was, I was out here at three o'clock in the morning. And then at about nine o'clock, I went back in the house and took a, took an hour long nap before I got on with the rest of my day. But I, I love being able to, um, you know, it's never a straight line for me. I never just write a song in one sitting. I always want to think about it. I want to be able to come in, especially when I was scoring film, it wasn't a nine to five existence at all. I always had to come in after dinner to uh, uh, make up for those couple hours that I was uh, um, underneath the piano in the fetal position trying to come up with an idea. You know what I mean? To begin with, I'd have to, once I got a roll going, I had to, you know, get, get my minutes done. And um <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's why, you know, and I have, uh, um, it makes it so I'm able to have a home life and I don't have to be away. I'm not gone to the studio like I used to be. I'm, I work a lot, but I'm home at least. And are there other parts to your daily discipline? Are there other things? Are you, you're a Libra. I know you just had a birthday. Virgo. Mm -hmm. I, oh, you're a Virgo. Oh, you're a Virgo. I thought you were October 2nd. I got your birthday all wrong. September 2nd. I don't know why a lot of people think my birthday is October. Why did I think that? I saw it wrong on Facebook. Okay, so you're a Virgo. Oh, so then you're very organized. So I have aspects of that, but there's other, in other ways, I'm not very organized at all, you know. But, are you uh, a math person? I, I would think people who do synth are math. Are you like? You'd think I'd be probably better at the synth thing if I did do math. <laughs> But uh, it was always, uh, you know, the technical thing was was a big struggle for me was uh, I had to make I made lots of friends that knew a lot and asked a lot of questions. And, you know, um, I'm not a good I'm not a good math person at all. My son, Dominic, is incredible with math, uh, not me at all. What? OK, so what? So you come from a, a lineage of drums, your father um, and and. All three of you boys played drums when you were little, correct? You sure, all started when we were little. Yeah, because there was just drums laying around the house all the time. There was always sticks and pads and, and drum sets set up. And uh, usually a drum set would be set up right next to a turntable and headphones. And uh, uh, that was always a, a fun thing to do. My brother Jeff did that quite a bit, just playing. I bet he did. And so was this something your father wanted for all of you? Uh, you know, I don't know about that. I mean, he was always very encouraging. I think he knew how tough the music business could be. And that, you know, uh, um, I mean, Jeff, it was obvious from kindergarten that he was had this white hot talent and was just always on fire. And, uh, um, you know, Mike, too. Mike was was uh, um, no one worried about Mike. I was I think he was worried about me. I, I really had had trouble. <laughs> oh. No, I had so much trouble. I mean, right. There was no such thing as uh, attention deficit disorder. Then it was just um, Steve's having trouble focusing, you know, <laughs> uh, especially when it came to piano lessons. You know, OK, that was my next question. Did all three of you take piano lessons? No, just me. Just me. And why was that? Because I was the only one interested in piano. You know, Jeff always gravitated towards drums. When the Beatles came out, Mike played drums. Mike was always a great drummer, too. When the Beatles... You, you, too. You're not such a shabby drummer yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while for me. Um, when the Beatles came out, Mike and mm -hmm. Jeff both started playing guitar. Um, and Jeff let it go after a few weeks and went back to drums. But Mike hung on to it for a little bit longer. And then when we moved out, um uh, to LA when Mike was in I think Mike was just getting into fourth grade and uh he started playing bass then and, and what what makes that trend what makes is it because like a bunch of his friends needed a bass player what makes him transition to bass do you think I think he just you know playing guitar a lot of my my favorite bass players a lot of them were former guitar players you know mm -hmm. people like David Hungate and Carol mm -hmm. Kay and my brother Mike and uh mm -hmm. I love it because they all they all play with a pick too. I love uh, I love hearing the bass with a pick, you know. Um, um, but it, it's uh, a lot of bass players were you know started off on guitar and those those are the same bottom four strings as on the mm -hmm. bass. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was always I saw a kid play when I was really young. My parents took me to some it was some kind of convention. It was some kind of uh, uh, 
show and there was this kid um this kid was playing like a lowry organ it was like some kind of theater organ and it had all the bells and whistles on it and sound effects and bass pedals and and i was just um i had started playing piano when i was four and started taking lessons with one of my dad's friends and um but i never had real good staying power i had this amazing series of teachers especially after we moved to la um, I had this incredible series of teachers and I, whenever it would get hard, I would kind of, my work habits were so horrible and I had so much trouble focusing. It, I would start skipping lessons and then eventually stop altogether, but I never gave up. And my dad would then, my dad was a great drum teacher and he would teach a lot of his cohorts in the studio. They would ask him to teach their kids. And if it was a piano player, my dad would say, Hey, do you want to teach my kid? And we'll just barter here. And, uh, and my dad would ask me, Hey, you want to take lessons with Claire Fisher or Victor Feldman, or I mean, legendary guys. And I'd always go, sure, you know, I'll give it a go, you know? And so, uh, um, I, that's my, uh, training was very eclectic and, um, but I had problems. It served you well. Thank you. It served you well. So, so do you think there is ADD? Was that going on for you? Because you clearly have tremendous discipline. Look what you've accomplished. You, you, I, I have ADD as we speak. Um, yeah. <laughs> and anything I've accomplished has been despite that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's been, uh, um, thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. But I, I, I like to think it's despite all the, uh, uh, the ways I get distracted. Do you have tools when you get distracted now? Do you because you're aware of what it is? Are you able to rechannel yourself? I I try to just uh, um, sometimes it's completely it's not something I think about. I'll just jump mm -hmm. out of my seat. I'll be in the middle of doing something and I'll literally just stand up, just spring up. And I try to recognize mm -hmm. if I get that urge before I act on it. I try to just sit with it for a little bit, stop myself, you know, or I, I've tried to, uh, um, you know, set a timer, say, you know what, I am not going to get up for this next hour, you know. I've and done... can you make yourself stay there if you've made that commitment? Usually, but, um, you know, I'm not good with sticking with that. I, I've been so, uh, I've been, to be honest with you, the the working on my own music, writing my own songs, being able to do exactly what I want to do has mm -hmm. been so much fun for me lately that uh, uh, I'm not looking for distraction. I'm having That's so, so much wonderful. Fun. Yeah, it is. It is. And you're working with one of your daughters, aren't you? Do you produce her? I know I don't produce it, either one of them, but uh, Heather and I are writing a song right now, but also Mickey and I just started writing a song with, um, <laughs> yeah, none of them, it's on a regular basis, but uh, mm -hmm. I do work with them. I love working with my kids. Mm -hmm. I love uh, encouraging them to do, to explore their creativity, you know? And that doesn't scare you. Did did your father, well, clearly your father encouraged you. He was throwing teachers at you and doing all of that. Yeah, but he also knew what a what a roll of the dice it was. I think they would have loved it if I had gone to college and gotten some degree, some kind of, had some plan B, you know, had some kind of plan B. I was very, all modesty aside, I was incredibly lucky. And my older brother, Jeff, was there leading the way and, uh, you know, I, I hung on to his coattails big time and he introduced me to people that wound up helping me out a lot. And uh, I found that niche with with programming synthesizers and stuff where I wasn't in comp. I was worried about how I was going to compete with with the keyboard players in Los Angeles. And it turns out I uh, um, found in the early 70s, you know, the guys who really could play great really didn't know synthesizers very well. And uh, so let's talk about how that happened for you. Okay. We were talking before we came live about Keith Emerson. Is he somebody that opened a door like one of those doors for you? Well, he, in the way that, uh, yes, in 1971, when I first heard him and saw him live, it was just this earth shattering uh, eye-opening experience. And uh, um 
both just his mu- his musicality, his musicianship, his composition, but also his synthesizers, these new sounds and uh, uh, him bringing it on stage with him and using it on record in a way that was just, I thought it was so cool. And I w- always want that stuff, you know. And, but it was so new and so rare. Was it hard to break into that? Um, like I said, I right away, it was very hard in that um, it was very, all that stuff was very unwieldy. And unlike today with MIDI, that didn't happen until 82, 83, in mm-hmm. the, especially in the mid 70s and later 70s, synthesizers didn't talk to each other. So if you were trying to play a Moog from an ARP, you weren't able to. They use different kinds of triggers. You would think it's a synthesizer. Why can't I? play both of them at the same time. Well, a lot of that stuff was very difficult, but I had made friends with these technical guys that would go, you know, it's just this little black box you have to build. And they would build them for me and I would have these things. And I I, um, I just made it so that I was very useful in the studio. I was a handy guy to have around. How did you school yourself in this stuff that was so new? Well, like I said, just just experimenting with that stuff with my own with my own stuff. I my brother Mike bought me uh, my first synthesizer rig when I got my first job uh, playing with Gary Wright, and I it was a Moog, and it was a uh, um, an Oberheim expander module in the sequencer, and the Moog didn't play the Oberheim unless you mm-hmm. had this a special cable and a, or an or a, this little black box. And uh, I realized how important that stuff was to interface that stuff. It was uh, uh, a challenge. And I was able to put this stuff in in guys' hands in the studio, guys like David Foster and David Page and and guys who were my heroes. I, I made myself very handy to be around because they were all wanting to use that stuff. But there wasn't an internet then. There wasn't a place for you to look this stuff up. So where are you learning how to do this? From friends. I I made friends, made fast friends with guys who did know how to do this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like Whether it was at a repair store or uh, um, when I would I would meet these guys at, at NAM shows or just from other friends. Um, and I'd, uh, I'd make fast friends with these guys and I'd go, you know, I'm trying to do this and can you help me do that? And they'd go, sure, that's easy. You know, and I'd, I'd be the one that had these little black boxes made, you know? So you kind of created your own niche mm-hmm. and your own just, place. Yeah, but I, yeah. I mean, and, and then it was also just programming, getting sounds on synthesizers, dialing up a Moog sound. A lot of guys could do it. They they could get lucky sometimes, but when the clock was running and the studio is charging $350 an hour and the artist and the producer is there and uh, they want to make sure they get something, they would hire me. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of guys. There were a few, but uh, they'd hire me to dial in their, their synth sounds because I kind of I spent a lot of time learning that stuff and and um, I got good at that because I saw there was that there was that hole there in the community, so to speak. You know what I mean? That was needed. OK, so before we, we move forward with this, let's just go back a little bit. So there's your dad. Your dad's this very, very successful drummer. Are you three brothers aware of him his position in the world how important he is are you in awe of him or is he just dad do you guys get it both no we totally got it and uh besides sure we had our heroes like keith emerson and and uh the beatles um, and of course the beatles and and those current bands but also we were very aware of my dad's world and studio musicians were our did he bring you into that world would he take you guys to the studio and stuff Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All the time, whenever we wanted to go. And and those guys, the guys that were doing sessions, mm-hmm. uh, that was attainable to us. The being a rock star was such a who's going to be the Beatles or whatever. I you know what I mean? Um, but being a studio musician, that was something 
that seemed attainable to us. And to so be that a, was the that was the goal. That was the dream to be a studio musician. For the most part, I mean, always in the back of our heads, we wanted to be in a ro famous rock band. Sure, but uh, um, that was such a, a roll of the dice. You saw how difficult that could be. How the stars had to align, and and uh, having hit records, and and um, you know. Being a studio musician uh, was a lot more attainable. Being a guy behind the scenes, not having to worry about what you looked like, whether you had the whole package or not, just it being about how good you played and how you delivered and uh, having good time. And so guys like Leon Russell and Don Randy mm. and, and Michael O'Mardian and David Page and David Foster, these were my heroes as far as studio musicians went. And, uh, uh, you know, Jeff, it was Jim Gordon and Jim Keltner and Hal Blaine and, mm -hmm. you know, Earl Palmer. And I could go on and on with the guys that uh, that were on the records, you know, and these were my dad's friends. My dad was hanging out with these guys at the union and uh, um, uh, we'd go to sessions and there they would be, you know, um, it just seemed attainable. And your dad played for everybody and so i'm assuming that you got to meet some crazy sure did you like gladys Knight? did you get to meet sinatra did you get to meet gladys knight did you get to I meet any of these people i didn't meet those people but i met mm -hmm. a few i met a few and my dad when he was first in town yeah he did for his first four or five years he did quite a lot of record dates mm -hmm. um, but he mostly kind of gravitated towards film TV and movie stuff. He was that guy sight reading marimba parts and xylophone parts, um, you know, having a sight read that stuff with an 80 piece orchestra. That was the, you know, it was very difficult stuff to do records. It's a much smaller thing. You can kind of get the part, you know, if you don't read, no big deal. As long as you delivered and came up with cool parts for the record, uh, um, you know, you were hired. Um, but yeah, he, uh, uh, yeah, we got to see these people. I, I, my dad did a share session once. I went down with him to A and M, uh, and um, uh, Phil Spector was the producer, and I hung mm. out in the booth the whole time and just tried to melt into the wall to just be a fly on the wall, and uh, it was an experience. Do you think through osmosis you took that what your father doing all these film sessions and stuff? Do you think that that helped? put you on your path towards becoming a composer? Do you think you watched that stuff going on? Do you, did you get some of that? Well, yeah, no, and all of us, you know, you got to understand when you're a young musician, let's say, especially drummers where, right, you're practicing your drum solos, you know what I mean? You're dreaming of being John Bonham or the guy in uh, uh, Name a Band who does a huge drum solo at some point in the show. And, uh, um, you're practicing your drum solo and stuff. Jeff, his heroes were these studio musicians who, mm -hmm. who didn't do drum solos. It was mm -hmm. all about time and pocket and laying a groove down and being consistent. Uh, uh, those were our heroes, mm -hmm. almost more so than the guys up on stage with Jethro Tull or whatever doing a drum solo. You know, mm -hmm. that stuff was much. So it kind of our priorities at a very young age, we didn't realize this like after high school when we try, we're, we're trying to do studio work and realized no one cared. You know what I mean? About how you soloed in the just right. sessions. We kind of were aware of that early on, the importance of serving the song, of it not being about you and just being a, a really a team player delivering for the producer so that you got called back again. You know what I mean? And serving the song, you know, helping the artist and producer do their thing. And I know Jeff's old was older than you. So at what point did you guys start playing in bands? And I assume Jeff was the first. Yeah. Jeff and Mike played together in high school quite a bit. They were just a year apart, but I was kind of, I was three years younger than Jeff. Um, so I kind of was in a next generation of of uh, of bands and uh, Jeff worked with David Page, you know, in high school, mm -hmm. they had the band together and Mike was a part of that quite a bit. But then right it was because the two fathers worked together, yes. didn't they? For, with Absolutely. Glenn Campbell, is that like, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but then the second, I was kind of the second generation and mm -hmm. when I was in high school, 
I had my high school, you know, uh, um, all of a sudden the, uh, the, the talent pool was insane. I had, you know, Steve Lukather, Mike Landau, John Pierce, and uh, Carlos Vega, who happened to go to Eagle Rock High, but my best friend Andy Leeds had met him. They were ushers at the Hollywood Bowl. And I had this amazing band in high school of just these incredible players that all and went And what up. kind of music were you guys doing and what kind of venues were you playing? We were doing, we were playing proms and dances and <laughs> homecoming dances and anything we could. Were you anything. playing covers? All covers. All covers. And, and what kind of covers were you playing? But, you know, we were doing covers, you know, at the time, uh, uh, it was interesting because, you know, we were doing top 40 covers. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it was definitely my band. We were kind of doing whatever it is I wanted to do. You know what I mean? And so it was, it was definitely, definitely an eclectic list. Um, you know, we would do things like roundabout. We would do things like uh, we would do a lot of Steely Dan. And um, <sighs> even at one point, you know, Jeff was played most of the drums on the Katie Light album. Yes, I do know. We flew to Denver to see Steely Dan and they were out with COVID last oh, week. Oh, oh really? Oh, oh. Yes. Horrible. Horrible. Yeah. We saw the Eagles though, which was fabulous with Joe Walsh. It was fabulous. But but yeah, Steely Dan was out with COVID. But anyway, yes, yeah, Steely Dan, fantastic. Jeff was bringing home rough rough mixes of the stuff they were oh. working on uh, for Katie Light. And we learned those songs Wow. before the album came out. And we're wow. We're playing them live, and you know we're playing Rose wow. Gully and Doctor Wu and and high in our high school band. Yeah, that's fun. crazy. Were people appreciating what you were doing? Did they get it? They were. They were. You know, a lot of times the, um, you know, the prom committee would come to, <laughs> would come to my parents' house where we were rehearsing, and you know, from some school in the valley, they would come, <laughs> and, uh, and we landed a bunch of gigs. You know, we were we were pretty good. And at what point did it become a brother's dream to? combine all three of you yeah no well uh you know jeff jeff's career um jeff's career in the studios took off so much as well as david pages and uh um you know they had done silk degrees with boz unbelievable you know? and that was david page uh um my brother jeff and david hungate the bass player mm -hmm. they were kind of becoming this this section in town that people were hiring together right you know? A lot of like Seals and Croft stuff. They were starting to do quite a bit of work together. And they did Silk Degrees, which was mm -hmm. David Page had co-written most of the songs on the album. And, um, you know, I had kind of given up hope. They were they were so busy and they were, uh, you know, David Page was getting hired. Now, why wasn't Mike in there? Mike was doing stuff. Mike was just like a year behind. Mike was Mike was in there. He was he would work a lot with Jeff. He would work a lot with David. Uh, he was also doing sessions and doing his thing. But there was this. But Hungate, how did how did that relationship happen as opposed to it being Mike from the start? Yeah, it's just that David was was in there with them. David was hired with them a lot. And they realized mm -hmm. they the three of them had this nothing against Mike. You know what I mean? But just mm -hmm. those three, they had this amazing chemistry, mm -hmm. you know, and they just really locked in with each other and didn't have to do a lot of talking. And it just they kind of uh, um, yeah, they just really locked in with each other and had this ESP that was undeniable. And uh, uh, Mike was always right there. Mike was always uh, and Mike was very busy on tour. He toured with Seals and Crofts for a long time, as well as. Uh, Michael Franks and some other people. He was he was in doing sessions for David mm -hmm. Foster and Greg Matheson, and he was uh, definitely one of the cats. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just uh, um, when they put Toto together, it was very much starting with that that core group of guys, the three of them, and then um, they had seen me playing live with Gary Wright and handling synthesizers, and uh, I did not play on. The Silk Degrees album, but David, when he was going to tour with Boz, it was the same kind of thing. Steve, come out and play the the synthesizer parts on Lido Shuffle, and come do the string ensemble lines. It was like the easiest gig in the world. I didn't have to have jazz chops to do that kind of stuff, and I, it was right in my lane and right in my wheelhouse, and and that directly led to me 
being that guy in Toto for the most part. You know what I mean? Being this gives to- me goosebumps. I mean, you're talking about the fabric of our lives. I mean, this is just historic. Ugh, this is crazy. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being a fangirl now. Well, that's okay. No, just the, the Boss Gags gig led directly to Toto. And Luke was also on the road with us with Boss. So, you know what I mean? David was becoming very aware of Steve Lukather and... Uh, um, and so did you guys know right from the get-go that this was, that you were a super group? Did you know that this was like the thing that you were going, that this, you were now going to be the rock stars that you had as little boys dreamt of being? No, we didn't know. I knew that, you know, David and Jeff were just going into the studios. They were going into Davlin's studio on Lancashire, and they were just doing these demos, the two of them. David playing keyboards and Moog bass and, and Jeff playing drums and David singing these tunes. And we knew that these, uh, uh, these songs were very, very strong. David was really on a roll. What a songwriter. It just done Silk Degrees and some other, you know what I mean, was doing a bunch mm-hmm. of other things. And he was on fire talent mm-hmm. wise. And uh, uh, he was on fire right then. So besides the playing aspect, you know, David had the songs. And uh, um, you know what I mean? He just surrounded himself with the rest of us, you know, with the band he wanted to have. I mean, thank God, like I said, I was thinking they weren't gonna ever do a band thing. It, they had too much to lose. Lukather and I were just starting. We were just dipping our toe in the business. I mean, we we're starting to do sessions, but you know, our- How, how old were you when, when Toto started? You know, I was 21, 20. Oh my gosh, baby, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Mm-hmm. And how how quickly did it? Oh, uh, pretty much out of the gate. You know, yeah. we were lucky that Boz's thing was so successful. Silk Degrees was so successful. And when a when a record like that that is successful, you know, the record company people, everybody's hanging out, everybody's mm-hmm. backstage, everybody's <laughs> congratulating themselves over. You know what I mean? It was a mm-hmm. big success for the. Mm-hmm people in promotion and the, the, you know, it was, it was very successful and very fun. You know, Boz's mm-hmm. concerts were always, he had these big bands and horns and background singers and they were these events. And, uh, and so, it was sexy music. It was very sexy music. Uh, it's very sexy music. Mm-hmm. Boz is great. Anyway, the record company was there and they kind of saw this band there. They saw this drummer and this bass player and this, keyboard player and this synth player and this guitar player and there was the guy that wrote all these songs on silk degrees they just were kind of short of a short of a lead singer you know what i mean which we got in bobby kimball but and where did bobby come from jeff and david had been working with some guys that were uh uh joe shermy and and they were there was this band with floyd sneed some of the guys that used to be in three dog night and they knew of this guy bobby kimball he was in this band ss fools and uh, they met him through that. And Bobby was kind of the, the, the kick-ass lead singer that we were, that was missing from the piece of the, you know, as far as the puzzle went, you know. And so hold the line, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's another song that's been covered more in more bars in, in America, in the world ever than that song. That was so- demos dave did that was one of the first things we cut you know was hold the line and uh um that was in the initial batch of demos pages we never had to do a showcase or anything like that like i what i was getting at was that the record company saw us right with boz they knew we were real people that could really play we weren't some old you know what i mean we were uh, a group of studio musicians and uh um that we had the song power and when they heard what we had what david and jeff had put on tape pretty much a record deal was put on our laps and uh um hold the line was the first single and it did really well right out of the gate and how was how was the chemistry adding bobby how was the chemistry with bobby in that mix personally it was it was a little, frankly, it was a little awkward at first, just from the being on stage with each other. We had grown up together. We had all grown right. up in the valley together and were such close, tight friends. And Bobby was from New Orleans. Bobby was from a completely different neck of the woods. But personally, we got along great. Bobby mm-hmm. was a 
heart and fun and funny and you know just so incredibly talented and just uh uh did his did his thing page would set him loose and he would do his thing and uh and it was great okay so let's talk about rosanna for a moment um so because i told you that i would i gotta so rosanna arquette was your girlfriend for a, a period of time yes and and uh that was during that was during the desperately seeking susan uh thing yeah, yeah? I, I believe so yes wow okay a lot, and, that, and, a lot of that time is a little fuzzy and we were we were but we were together quite a while and uh, and so that a lot so that time was a little fuzzy because there was some drinking and drugging going on i'm guessing yeah not so much drinking on my part but Definitely, definitely uh, some other things, uh, definitely some drugging, you know what I mean, in those days. Um, but, you know, our relationship wasn't about that. She was she was her career was just kind of taking off. And she was this amazing muse kind of for everybody, you know, for for David. When David Page met her, he was had just started writing the song Rosanna. And I bring her over to his house and he introduces her. And I think he was a little taken with her. And all of a sudden he had a name that fit his, the song he was working on. And it kind of, uh, I think was a little bit inspired by her and, uh, um, you know, it was never anything weird. She just was, she always loved music and she was always encouraging as far as that stuff went. And, uh, um, it was great for a while, you know, it was great until it wasn't great, you know? Um, but as uh, those things go, I assume that she loved that the song was named Rosanna. Uh, I, you, you know, maybe at the time, but I know it hasn't, you know, I, I've always felt bad for her because, you know, when you're on a bunch of talk shows and they're, the producers are looking for something to talk about, uh, this movie mm. has come up a whole lot. And, and I think she's gotten sick of that over the years of that, mm. the producers being lazy and just talking about Rosanna. And uh, she's expressed that, I think, in so many words here. <laughs> Uh, um, that's understandable, but um, at the time it was a, it was an incredible time for the band because that record did really well, and Rosanna was the what Rosanna was the first single. It was us trying really really hard right out of the gate, and uh, we were kind of up against the wall, and all of a sudden things were going really really well for us, you know. What, what, was were those fun days, those MTV days where? Um, I mean, I imagine shooting the videos wasn't always the best time because shoots Low. can be a nightmare. Low. But 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 the the whole MTV thing and like your videos are just playing everywhere. Yeah, we love the idea of it. But making videos, especially in those days where mm. I mean, we would be a pretty penny out of our pockets and the, the results, though, that all that video looking stuff was just <laughs> horrendous. And some of these storylines, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it makes some of this stuff watchable <laughs> today. And I personally, at the time, I, I would have loved it if it was, you know, if it was something cool we were doing, but we were doing these rushed, silly kind of things. And we weren't, you know, we were really behind the scenes kind of guys, you know, we were really, uh, um, none of us were front men except you know, Bobby Kimball, let's say we're supposed to be the front man. So we were, we weren't camera ready. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so doing that stuff, I used to just loathe it. I just wanted to be in the studio working on my music, not making. Okay. Music. So how about world touring though, and playing mm -hmm. these enormous stadiums and that we loved that we absolutely loved playing that stuff live. I used to love trying to recreate what I did on what we did on the record live and bringing it to people. It was, uh, um, it was a blast. It was a blast uh, playing Budokan for multiple nights. And, you know, we did really well in Europe, you know, did really well in especially Northern Europe and, and in these big cities. And it was just, uh, we were living the dream. It's, it's an absolute blast and they're still doing it. Luke's got a, uh, the band is still together, a version of the band that Luke has put together. And it's always, he always, always has just incredible musicians doing it, you know, uh, um, it's, it's still, and people love going and hearing those songs. It brings a lot it of, it wasn't that long ago that you were doing it just yeah, before I, COVID, right? Yeah. I left after the second, after the sixth, excuse me, the sixth album I, I left, but then 
I did a couple more tours, but then I was, I've been out of it for quite a long time until 2010. Mm -hmm. Luke asked me to do one summer and it turned into nine years. <laughs> Those things do, and I had a blast and they took and amazing care of me. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, I had an absolute ball going out there and, and playing those tunes again with, you know, with the band, with the guys and for all those fans. That, that's what I was going to ask. It must be a very, it must've been a very different experience at this stage of life. I would imagine the touring part is a lot more arduous, but the appreciation of the people and looking out and seeing people of all ages, children with their parents and their grandparents singing every word to the songs has to be a different kind of pleasure, I would imagine. It was great. I thought my road days were completely behind me. I was kind of done with the road, but I'm glad I got to do that and and take bows for all that work. There was a lot of work. Uh, uh, we worked real hard on those albums and and um, it was fun to come out again, you know, to go out again and and do that but i'm i'm glad that's over i'm not i'm not that guy uh i had a blast and like i said the guys treated me incredibly um but i'm you know my instrument is the studio and i i this is where i'm i feel like i do my thing this is this is my instrument is is the studio Okay, and we're, we're going to talk about um we're going to talk about what you're doing now but before we do that because everyone will kill me if i don't ask so what happened with Bobby Kimball? Why was that such a short run for him? And um, why did he go? What, why did he what, leave the band? Yeah. You know, it was just, it was the, uh, uh, um, the times. Um, uh, and you say short run for him. He did, the, you know, he did those first four albums, which mm -hmm. were incredible. And he delivered in a real big way, those four albums. We were mm -hmm. all all of us in the band were kind of getting the worst for wear. We'd been working really hard for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and after the fourth album, which was so successful, instead of striking while the iron was hot, we decided to take some time and uh, we worked on the soundtrack to Dune and uh, there was a lot of time elapsed. And uh, um, when we finally got around to doing the next album, when we finally started writing and recording the next album um bobby had trouble delivering you know and mm -hmm. i think and any of us that were singing at that time because of the havoc that was we were all reeking on our bodies <laughs> might have had trouble singing you know mm -hmm. uh we could all play i mean i would you know live i would always feel sorry for the singers because we'd all be up there with strep throat and sore throats and whatever because of how because of the lifestyle we were leading and, but yet the singers had to deliver, deliver in that way. Night right. after night. And it was, you know, it was hard. I sure couldn't have done that. You know, mm -hmm. I could, I could pound away on my keyboards and get away with it, but um, um, are you, it just, are you um, guys okay now? Are you um, okay now? Yeah. With Bobby Kimball, I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, Bobby's really struggling right now. He's got some very serious health issues, and uh, we've been okay with Bobby for a long time. Bobby wound up coming back to the band. Bobby wound up joining the band when I, my brother Mike was doing it with Luca Thur, and and uh, when Simon Phillips took over. Bobby had another, a second long run with the band that was very mm -hmm. fruitful, and and uh, you know, so uh, all was forgiven, and. Uh, um, you know, and now Joseph's been back doing it for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Bobby's really struggling with some some health stuff, some very serious health issues. Mm -hmm. and, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Yeah, we wish him well. He's always always a sweetheart to me. There was never it was never a it was never an issue about that. Bobby was always, you know, uh, the most fun guy. It just was about. Uh, um, you had to in the band you had to deliver you had to be able to do your job in the studio and if you couldn't you know what i mean there was a problem you know it was just kind we, of that. we talked about this really uh briefly but i i'm a sober woman and i i know that you're a sober man what um why did you get sober steve you know it just was uh because i i uh you know i couldn't stay at the party any longer it wasn't serving me any longer you know when we like everyone else, you know, we started out, we were just celebrating life and, you know, 
I started doing cocaine in the late seventies when it wasn't addictive. Remember when I, <laughs> I remember those days, <laughs> I mean, sir, you know, it, <laughs> you know, and uh, who knows when, ex- when it exactly it is that you cross that line. Mm-hmm. You know? But I remember that all of a sudden, instead of it just being a, a way to enhance what was going on in the studio, it almost became necessary. Mm-hmm. And I hated that. I, I, I felt so lucked, so lucky and so blessed. And so uh, to be able to have, you know, every synthesizer I ever dreamed of and 24 track tape machines and be able to do whatever I wanted to do. I was so lucky and blessed to have all that stuff. And um, I became dependent, you know, it became a, a dependence thing. And it was, I hated that. I hated that. How long have you been sober? Uh, I, I, you know, it depends how you define sober off of, off of, uh, as far as, uh, alcohol and, and Coke goes, it's been over 30 years, you know? Wow. I, okay. Wow. Yeah. I know I had a surgery that I had some really bad nerve damage after a benign brain tumor was removed and they've never been able to figure out how to stop this nerve damage. That's can be incredibly painful sometimes. So I, 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 for 10 years, I was smoking weed to just to uh, address this, but I didn't drink any in any of that time or, mm-hmm. or really do anything else. But I've, I've kind of stopped even doing that because I am just having so much fun doing the work I do. And, and um, when I smoke weed, I like to have that really strong sticky green stuff. I, I, I only kind of can do it one way. And it's, it's, I find myself having to recover from from it several times a day to reach this window where I can get work done. And I'm now I just kind of suffer. I, I just deal with it. I'm I'm trying some different medications over and over uh, uh, to deal with it, to deal with this nerve stuff, because I still have it. And it's been probably 20, you know, I don't know how long it's been since my surgery, but it's been a really long time. But I just deal with it. And I'm having so much fun with the music I make and with writing songs and being able to be my indulgent self and do whatever the hell I want to do that, uh, it really, it's, uh, uh, more than makes up for any of I this. love that. So Steve, how did you segue from studio musician, touring musician to composer, which is a very different thing. I mean, I know you were in the studio with your father and watching all of that go on, but how did you actually become the guy? The guy, like Justified, how did you yeah. do that? You know, Justified was a great experience. I don't know if I ever really became the guy. What what happened was, is I finally left, I left the band at a time and it was very peaceful and, and amicable. And the band was just trying to, ch- wanting to change direction with the times at the time. And they wanted to do a lot less, you know, there was a time in the 90s, all of a sudden where it became really unpopular to have a keyboard player in your band, let alone mm-hmm. two. You know what I mean? And uh, stuff that I did was just the kind of stuff they wanted to kind of, you know, shave back on and not mm. do so much of these grandiose synth extravaganzas. You know what I mean? That was my reason for my reason for existing in the band. So um, they did, you know, uh, um, I just decided it was time to move on. And then and my idea was that I would retire from the band and touring and just write songs like just write a whole bunch of human natures and that would keep me busy. And which we have, okay. We have to talk about that. You have to stop right there. Now was, was that supposed to be a Toto song? No, it wasn't supposed to be. It just was a song I had written around that time. I played it for the guys. They heard it before Quincy did. They heard the demo. I'd been working on the demo on the road to it, but it was just a, a Steve song. You know what I mean? It just was my typical kind of, uh, a mid-tempo ballad, you know, that I wrote a lot of in those days. And um, yeah. How did that become part of Thriller? You know, when Quincy heard it, Quincy heard it and uh, and he loved the atmosphere of it. And it wasn't finished. I would have never played it for him because there were, you know, you can hear online, you can Google human nature demo and hear exactly what Quincy heard. And uh, it was... Um, he just loved the vibe of it. You know, he wasn't looking for a song like that at all, but loved the vibe of it. And he he put me together with John Bettis, who wrote the mm-hmm. verse lyrics and did just this amazing job making it, uh, uh, giving it a real lyric and brought in like Steve Lukather, who made it 
brought did this incredible guitar part, you know what I mean? That made it, that made it Michael, that made it, you know, an R more of an R and B thing and, and had Michael Boddicker and, and added some percussion and stuff and did his thing. And, um, it was, um, again, I'm very blessed. And then Michael to have Michael Jackson sing one of your songs, you know, everyone with all the, the, uh, you know, the noise and the garbage that's, that's said and, and goes on about it. It, um, everyone forgets just how incredibly talented the guy was. What an incredible musician Michael was. What an amazing singer he was. And then I I don't think we forget that. I, no matter what they, no matter what we hear about the personal, I, I don't think anybody who's ever seen him perform can ever forget that about him. Yeah. Yeah. And he brought so much to the table with human nature and it just uh, 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 just elevated everything. And and uh, um, it was just this amazing experience. I was so, so blessed. And I, I, it sounds corny coming out of my mouth like that, but it just was the stars just aligned for me there. No, yeah. what an enormous, I mean, the, the greatest, like the biggest album that ever Sure. It was great. But to go back to what we were talking about, Mm -hmm. I thought I would spit out a whole bunch of those, you know, and uh, um, because I felt like writing those kind of tunes was easy. But, you know, come to find out that, you know, without a deadline. I was completely useless. I I never Mm -hmm. finished anything, actually, you know, without a deadline. Toto was always, it was very loose. And even us, we'd still be mixing Africa if we could be without a <laughs> deadline. You know what I mean? You know, they finally take the tapes away from you. You know what I mean? There's that deadline. And um, I had been working with my friend, James Howard, mm-hmm. a friend to all of us. James was doing really well doing movies. James had a, arranged a couple of the Toto albums, did all the string arrangements on Toto 4. And was Which, a- by the way, we just watched The Fugitive recently. It is a perfect movie. It is a perfect, perfect movie. And it's, it's a perfect scored. score. You it's know a what perfect I mean? score. It's a perfect score. Knocked it out of the park. Not, yeah. I, I worked, I did a lot of, uh, uh, I was around a whole lot. Uh, for the fugitive and stuff it was such an exciting time because james was just killing it and Mm -hmm. uh, anyway i started doing some synthesizer work for him and at one point he turned to me and said do you want to try doing some of this some of his other friends were were getting into scoring tv shows he was he was helping some of us out you know hans zimmer's thing was was going and all these young guys from bands were starting to dabble in scoring. And I remember I said, you know, I don't know if I could have music finished by Thursday. I've never, I've never had to do that. And uh, I come to find out that I, with those deadlines, uh, uh, you know, Snuffy was the hero to us all. You know what I mean? It it, uh, not only could I, I love the deadline, the deadline. Wow. Me deliver. I, I would finish things. And, uh, um, so now that's kind of informed now that I'm not touring anymore and, uh, uh, and not doing television shows anymore, you know, justified was a great experience. All the producers were so cool and they ran interference for me. Like, you know, you wouldn't believe, but, uh, um, now I'm able to finish stuff because of the discipline I got from working on film. Really? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, as much as I enjoy, as much as we all enjoy what we do, I mean, we're making music for God's sakes, but sometimes with a, when you're scoring, you know what I mean? Sometimes it actually becomes work, you know, it actually mm-hmm. crosses into being what you might call work, whether it's something you don't really have your heart into or just that you've got to do five of those by tomorrow. Uh, um, there's times you'd rather be hanging out with your family or you'd rather go out to dinner with your friends or you'd rather do something else. And you've got a deadline that is you've got to keep if you're going to get, you know what I mean, ever get hired. Mm-hmm. So I learned that was finally where I learned some discipline in my life as far as uh, deadlines go. And now I'm able to impose them on myself. And uh, and so now, Steve, is it all about is it all about Steve's music now, or are you doing session work stuff? Because you have played with everybody. I mean, your discography is insane. From Earth, Wind, and Fire to Chicago to, I mean, you started with Bette Midler. I mean, you've played with you've played with amazing with on everything. Miles Davis. I mean, all kinds of you. You kind of talked about jazz with a little bit of disdain, but Miles Davis, oh, for Christ's sake. Oh, there's no, there's no disdain. Um, 
I didn't no, I, I I didn't mean disdain, but I mean you kind of. But yeah, it's but so so now where are we now? Is it is it is it? Yeah, it's mostly about. I'll do sessions for friends when they mm-hmm. know what it is they want. They know what they know. If they know they want me to do my thing, I'm always happy to do sessions for friends. But. 98% of the time I'm working on my music. I'm nurturing myself. The reason I got into all this stuff, all these synthesizers and sequencers was, was just imagining what I would do with it was to serve my songwriting. And, um, uh, you know, you get real busy. I mean, you're very, very, again, it's to be able to have job scoring TV shows. It's like winning the lottery. It's not, easy to do it's not easy to get those gigs being in a successful band it's like winning the lottery having a song on thriller it's forget okay. about it much more established songwriters than me tried to get a song on thriller and it was a complete fluke i've been so lucky and uh i've won i feel like i've won the lottery several times in my life and and uh um anyway what it's afforded me to do is that now at my age, I'm able to um, to do what I want to do musically, and that's that's write my songs and finish them. Because my songwriting process isn't, you know, a lot of guys like my bandmate Steve Lukather. He can sit down if you get together with him and write a song in two hours. You're going to have a song, and it's going to wow. be, and he's going to leave, and the song's going to be done, for the most part, mm-hmm. for the most. And I've worked with a lot of writers like that. I am not that guy. I, I occasionally it's all kind of come at once. Usually I get a start, but then I want to think about it. I want to go, hey, you know what? I can write a better chorus than that. And I want it's a process for me. So so like uh, human nature, what how 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 long was that process for well, you? That, that came together pretty quick. As far as the writing goes, that came together mm-hmm. kind of in all in one sitting. That but that was the exception. But then I, on the road, then we were touring for total four and I was demoing it on the road. I was working on the demo of it, coming up with ideas for it production wise, all that stuff that Quincy liked about it. It's not like I was playing it on guitar or singing it to anybody. It was all about the tape slap on the voice and the synthesizers and the, the vibe, the atmosphere, which is always hugely important to me and my songs. So speaking about collaboration, we were also talking briefly before we went on the air about Allie Willis, our mutual friend. And and so you did do some work with Allie, you said. Yeah, you know, I'd of course, I'd always heard of Allie Willis. She was this Mm -hmm. very famous songwriter. And Mm -hmm. uh, Greg Sill, this music Mm -hmm. supervisor friend, the great Greg Sill, who's no longer with us. And I was he had gotten me the gig and justified it got me a lot of film work with uh, uh, you know, we were working a lot together. He knew Allie very well. And Allie lived in down the street from me. Mm-hmm. She lived right in my neck of the woods. And because uh, he knew I was looking for collaborators, mostly lyricists. My mm-hmm. my output musically is great, greatly outweighs my my lyrical output. I maybe have an idea, but uh, I, that's where I always need the most help. And um, he suggested I get together with Ali and I was like, sure. And it's always, especially when someone's established and has a track record, that personal thing of writing songs, everybody's got their quirks. And especially me, like I said, I've, I've worked with people where I'll pull out one of my, something I consider a gem, something that's one of my favorite things out of 50 starts. I have, this is my, this is the one I think is the hit or you know what I mean? This is the right. one. And you'll get together with somebody sometime. And they'll go, oh, yeah, that's great. And they just want to they throw something against that. And you know, great. We're done. See you later. And I'm like, well, 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 well yeah, yeah. you know, I'm not sure that that's that 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 verse deserves my chorus. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever. Ali was just uh, our experience together. We finished one song. It's called Little Things. And it wound up being on a total on a, on a Toto album. Um, and it was just the best writing experience. We oh. didn't get one sitting. We got together probably four or five times altogether. But it was uh, uh, it was so much fun. She was such a groove. She was so, you see, to certain people, you see why they're who they are, why they have mm-hmm. the track record they have. Mm-hmm. You know, some people you kind of go, boy, they were, <laughs> they must have been lucky or whatever. <laughs> 
the stars really aligned or their success was a fluke. Not with Allie, you kind of, she was this force of nature and we just hit it off. And uh, uh, our our collaboration was was so much fun. And I was so excited to have made this connection. And uh, and then, you know, she unfortunately passed away just a couple of years ago and it just was completely heartbreaking, you know. We were supposed to have fried chicken two days after she passed. And, and, oh my goodness. Yeah. And yeah. Sorry. She was, she was, thank you. Yeah. She she played my living room a bunch and did a bunch of stuff with me. She was phenomenal. But what a force of nature she was. Yeah, it was um, funny. I, I had these chord changes, and usually I'm the one who winds up coming up with the melody. And I, like I said, I lean on someone for for lyrics. And uh um it was so funny. We're writing lyrics. We're writing lyrics together. And I assumed she was going to run with the ball and, mm -hmm. and she'd say, so what do you want to say here? How should we start this off? And I'd say, I don't know, something like this. And she'd go, I like that. Let's keep that. Oh. And she'd write it down. And then she'd go, now, where should we go? What should, what should this next line be? And I'd say, like I do when I'm working with lyricists, I'll just be real spitballing and very vague and just kind of very, you know, I want to express the emotion of this. It should say something like this. And Allie would go, huh, I like that. That's great. And she'd write it down. And then when it got time to tweak the melody, it was all her. So wow. I wrote the lyrics and she wrote most of the melody. It was, I love that. It was so funny. It just, that's her though. She knew when when what I was spitballing was, was on and was, was keepers, you know what I mean? And then, uh, I mean, she definitely came in when there was some, uh, uh, I really needed some, some of her prose. She definitely came in and delivered, but. Uh, Did was, she ever tell you the story of body? Ah, she didn't know what body ah meant either. I mean, it's, like, funny. it's perfect. Right. All songwriters have stories they love to tell, you know? Oh but, my gosh. You know, yeah. Steve, I, um, Thank you so much for doing this. It has been such a joy. All right, before we go, tell yeah. me, where can we see you do, do Steve Picaro? Where can we see you play your music? You can't. I don't, oh, come uh, on. I, 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 I'm, I'm, um, I'm very comfortable being a behind the scenes guy. If I could sing, if I could sing in front of people, it would be a different story. I'd love or if I had a gazillion dollars and could hire a band and a bunch of singers to do my music, I'd love to do mm -hmm. a, a big live show and stuff. But um, I'm having so much fun with what I'm doing. This is my instrument. This is where I shine. This is my this is my lane, as we say, as in stay in your lane. I think I feel like, you know, I've dabbled over here and there, but I'm I finally feel like when I'm in the studio writing writing songs and I have hundreds of starts that I could finish. And I love collaborating, by the way, I'm mostly collaborating with all different people and singers. And, and when I'm in that, and when I'm in that space, I feel like I'm not in competition with anybody. I, I feel like I have my unique voice and I'm, I'm, um, I'm lucky I get to just do just that. And I'm always hoping that in the way Michael, the way Michael, backed into human nature the way it was some fluke and he acts, you know what I mean? He heard it, wound up doing it. I'm always hoping that Adele and Bruno Mars and Michael Bublé and you know what I mean? The, the artists I so respect and relate to, I'm always hoping that they accidentally, you know, they somehow hear one of my songs and want to do them. I'm always, that's always my ulterior motive. But in the meantime, I'm just going to keep doing my thing and I'll put out my solo albums that my you know. so someday somehow do you do you have one in the cooker now yes I got yes I actually have a couple in the cooker now that I'm now that this is all I've been doing for the last mm -hmm. three years or so I've got like three albums worth of stuff uh, yeah I'm so I'm very excited and it's so much fun working on them now because it's it's the most of the hard part is done and it's uh, uh so how do you drop one now i mean in this crazy time of music streaming and there are no more well, albums that's and the trick that's the so that's what do you do i mean i'll eventually just release it and sell a cd to my you know seven hardcore fans and, <laughs> and uh, everyone else will hear it on youtube if they're you know what i mean somehow i guess i mean that's that's the 
that's the lowest common denominator. You know what I mean? Again, I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping uh, some music supervisor hears one of my tunes and most of them I'm not singing on. It's, it's, I'm the artist, but uh, uh, I've always got, you know, I, I like to, uh, I'll sing a couple of my things cause uh, um, I just do, there's no one else, but I've got uh, some great singers singing my stuff. And I'm always hoping some music supervisor hears one of them and wants to put it in a movie and a whole bunch of people go, wow. Do you, well, well, is your, are you, do you have people sending them out to the Bruno Mars? And to the, I do. Yeah. I'm starting to get better at that side of the business. I've usually mm -hmm. been so busy doing the creating part. I'm realizing, you know what I mean? And it's a little late. I'm realizing how important it is to have your, the business end of all this stuff together, you know? So well, I have no doubt that we'll be hearing lots more from you. And oh, yeah. um, I um, I have enjoyed this so very much. You are absolutely delightful. As talented as you are, is as delightful as you is you. I, I'm, I can't talk now. Anyway, thank you so much, Steve, for uh, for taking this time with me. And and dinner soon, I hope. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve.